Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, and as always, it's my pleasure to be here. And we've opened up a discussion here in the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power, by R.W. Thompson, about these false decretals, the so-called pseudo-Isidorian decretals, that establishes the foundation for the blasphemous pretensions, the temporal power of the Pope, that essentially make him king of kings and lord of lords on the earth. Now, these pseudo-Isidorian decretals, once we get through them, I'm sure we'll all agree, could be classified as nothing but the most childish fabrications. R.W. Thompson is going to rip to shreds the very foundational basis for the pretension known in the world today as the papacy and leave it in foundational ruin. Now, these pseudo-Isidorian decretals are such bald-faced lies and fabrications that a, it would make a child blush. But I want my listeners to know that the papacy still insists that they form a legitimate basis for the Pope's divine right to rule the world and to rule over the kings of the earth. Now, beginning, uh, we're going to back up a little bit for continuity purposes this morning, page 373, the first full paragraph, if you're following along in your own copy, page 373, the first full paragraph on the page. Speaking of these pseudo-Isidorian decretals, R.W. Thompson says... These pseudo-Isidorian decrees were designed as a compilation of the canons established as far back as the pontificate of Clement I, or Clement I, in the year 91 A.D., so as to fill up the gap between him and Pope Siricius, who became Pope in the year 385. Remember, they were going to assemble a code of canon laws, assemble a code of papal decrees that established the Pope's immunity, okay, and also establishes his temporal power in the world. But they only went back to the year 385 A.D. and left a gap. So what, what did the Pope say prior to 385 A.D.? Well, I assert that for lack of any reliable information, or for the lack of any information that supported this gigantic pretension known as the papacy, they simply fabricated it. Okay? Now, it says, during this period, there were 33 popes. During this period, prior to 385 A.D., there were 33 popes, all of whom, except one, Liberius, had been made saints. We shall better understand the purpose and the character of these decretals by going back to the times of their alleged origin. The second century closed with the pontificate of Pope Victor the Four, uh, excuse me, Victor the First, who distinguished himself by having, with the celebrated Tertullian, adopted the heresy of Montanists and inaugurated the controversy in relation to the festival of Easter. Remember this quarrel over when it is appropriate to celebrate Easter uh, became the, the, the genesis of an eventual split between Eastern and Western Catholic churches. Now, the Asiatic Christians, or those in the East, followed the custom established by the evangelists St. John and St. Philip, celebrated this festival like the Jews on the 40th day after the first new moon of each year. And when Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, and the disciple of St. John visited Rome about the year 167 or 68 and found that it was the custom there to wait until the Sunday after the 40th day, he declined to adopt it. And it was agreed between him and Anicetus, who was then Pope, that each church, the Eastern and Western, should follow its own custom. Thus, up to this time, there was perfect equality between the Greek and Latin churches, between East and West, 
each containing its own indep- uh, main, uh, retaining its own independence of the other. But when Victor I became the Pope, he was not disposed to let to allow the affairs of the churches to remain in this quiet and pacific condition, so admirably calculated to advance the cause and progress of Christianity. He was the first pope who employed the thunders of excommunication, which have since been used by such terrible, uh, with such terrible effect upon both nations and individuals. He excommunicated Theophilus for asserting that Christ was a mere human, and Praxeus for his attempt to abolish the distinction between the three persons in the Trinity. For the latter purpose, he assembled at Rome a council, the first ever convened by a pope of his own authority. And this exercise of power caused him to conceive of the idea of the superiority of the Roman Catholic Church over all other churches. And hence, in order to establish this superiority, he resolved upon forcing the Eastern Christians to adopt the custom of Rome in reference to Easter, and thus inaugurated a controversy which gave rise to subsequent usurpations, and in the end, to the final separation of the Greek and the Latin Christians. Again, R.W. Thompson uses the word Christians to describe the Latin church. (laughs) Anyway, it says, this effort to make a matter of so small importance a cause of quarrel was at its inception resisted by many of the bishops, and Irenaeus, bishop of Lyons, censured the pope for it in the name of the Church of France, then called Gaul. He yielded to the pressure of these opinions, but not without having contributed toward uh, toward laying the foundation for the subsequent claim of supremacy. His immediate successor, Zephyrinus, who became Pope in the year 202 A.D., has also been accused of favoring the Montanists. But this accusation is probably unjust, as imitating Victor... He, ex- he excommunicated them, including Tertullian. Tertullian was so much esteemed for his piety, and on account of the services he had rendered Christianity in his Apology and other works, especially that against the heresy of Marcion, that his excommunication excited general indignation. And in order to escape the consequences of this act, Pope Zephyrinus was driven to assert that the claim of superiority made by Victor, hoping therefore to pacify the Western priesthood by the prospect of their sharing with him the power and authority he hoped to secure by a triumph over the Eastern Christians. Under these two pontificates, therefore, from the year 194 to 221 A.D., ambition first began to creep into the church at Rome and to stimulate its popes to substitute motives of worldly grandeur and wealth for that simplicity which had distinguished the humble fisherman who had followed the Savior during his earthly but divine ministrations. And thus we see the reason why these false decretals are carried back to the times previous to Pope Sericius, in order to show that these popes, who were the alleged authors of them, predicated their claim of superiority upon the doctrines they contained and designed them as the means of elevating the popes into earthly monarchs and the whole priesthood into a powerful and irresistible hierarchy. The efforts now making to revive and reestablish them in this country make it important that the people should understand what they contain so as to know what is meant by the temporal power of the Pope and what is proposed in the place of our Protestant institutions. They are also an additional key for the interpretation of the encyclical and syllabus of error of Pope Pius IX of 1864. Let me tell you, if you don't know what the encyclical and syllabus of error of 1864 is all about, I suggest that before we even discuss it here uh, in the book, that you do a little of your own research and discover that the papacy is asserting itself as Christ on earth, 
literally condemned every government that was not wholly and completely subservient to the will of the Pope. And that, and the, and the greatest example of that was the United States of America, where the people elected their sovereigns, and they were, and the sovereigns were to rule completely independent of the papacy. It was an attack on constitutional republics, and Pope Pius IX considered them all usurpations of his his rightful or rather divine right, according to him, his divine right to rule the world, and simply established what has transpired ever since, a destruction of any government that asserts independence of the papacy, of papal control. The temporal authority of the Pope, the temporal power of the Pope is what we're talking about. The end game for the papacy is, was, and always will be to raise itself to world supremacy. Okay. King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, in the first epistle attributed to Pope Clement I, he is made to represent himself as having immediately succeeded the Apostle Peter in the, in the pontifical chair, whereas it is well understood and now conceded that Linus and Anacletus were both bishops of Rome before Clement. Okay? See, we're, we're heading on this journey we're going to weave in and out between all the foundational stones of the Vatican, of the papacy. And we're going to find out there's no mortar. Okay? Any little shaking of the earth, and this entire foundation crumbles. They've built the house of the popes on shifting sand, and even a child could topple it. And R.W. Thompson is going to do a masterful job of laying down before my listeners exactly how the foundation of the papacy crumbles under its own weight, under its own manufactured, and I would say childishly manufactured foundation. It's, it, you're in for a real surprise at just how childish the fabrications are. Now, you be the judge for yourself, but we'll continue here. It says, but it needed authority of this kind to establish the assumption that Peter was the first pope. And this forgery answered the purpose. So, the very first stone laid in the tottering foundation of the papacy is that Peter, the apostle, is the rock and the foundation of church when the scriptures clearly show that Christ is the rock and the foundation of the church, and Peter was simply another stone laid upon that foundation. Yet the papacy, claiming its divine right to rule the world, places Peter, the rock of the church, and that all of the popes are his successors. So here we have the first stone laid in this make-believe foundation of the papacy, and it is full of holes, no mortar in it. Now, the papacy first had to, to establish that Peter was the first pope of the Roman Catholic Church. And the facts of Scripture clearly indicate Peter never, ever, ever set foot in Rome. And I always like to make a little joke, you know, if Peter had ever gone to Rome, he wouldn't be able to find a bathroom. He'd never been there. Paul established the first church of Jesus Christ in Rome, and it was not the Roman Catholic Church. It was the church of Jesus Christ, a heavily persecuted church by the Romans. We beat that to death, but, but it, it bears repeating for those who are just tuning in. So they had to come up with this forgery to... to give substance to this smoke and mirrors that Peter was the first pope. And that's how they accomplished it. And it says, besides, it recognized a book called, quote, the itinerary, or book of the voyages of St. Peter, which is undoubtedly apocryphal. 
There are four other epistles also attributed to Clement, all of which are manifest forgeries. In one, he is made to speak of princes and other ecclesiastical officers of the church, when in the time of Clement, none such were known. In another, he is represented as addressing the epistle to St. James, wherein he calls himself the successor of St. Peter when when James died before Peter. And Clement is made to approve the doctrines of the Nicolaitans, who thought, says Dupin, the historian, quote, that women ought to be kept in common, unquote that women ought to be kept. You know, they've kept that tradition. They're called nuns today. Women kept in common for the priests. (laughs) Now, in a pretended epistle by Pope Anacletus, he's represented as a defender of Clement when he died before Clement was Bishop of Rome. You see how childish this is. And he says but he is made to speak of having received many things by tradition in order to substitute tradition for fact, a thing which it is impossible for Anacletus to do because he lived in the times of the apostles when no tradition was necessary. The special object of this epistle, however, was to establish by Anacletus the proposition, quote, that appeals from secular judges ought to be determined before bishops, unquote, and that, quote, the privileges and laws of the church ought to be confirmed, unquote, that there should be, quote, appeals from ecclesiastical judges to the Holy See, unquote, that there are primates and metropolitans in the church, whereas it is well known that none of these orders existed and none of these things were ever talked of or debated until after the death of Anacletus. You see what the papacy is doing? Trying to build its hierarchy, trying to justify the entire machinery of the papacy, the temporal power machinery of the papacy, And they have to resort to the most childish, disprovable fabrications to do it. But remind yourself that this is still the foundation upon which the papacy presumes to rule the world. And we've only scratched the surface. R.W. Thompson is very thorough in his line-by-line attack upon every stone of this foundation. He says, in another epistle by the same bishop, it is said that he, quote, would neither have bishops to be accused nor judged, unquote, a claim of immunity still persevered in. That's right. The papacy, together with his hierarchy, the bishops, are immune. They cannot, but no charge can be levied against them. Okay? They are immune from civil law under the pretext that the divine is over the, the, the world, okay? The Pope being the divine replacement of Christ on the earth and that he should not have charges levied against him by mere mortals, okay? That's still the standard in the Roman Catholic Church. Now, there have been exceptions to this, and mostly, I think, out of self-preservation, when, when certain priests have committed such atrocities that the overwhelming, hue, the overwhelming hue and cry from the people demanded justice, and the papacy had to relent and allow these sacrificial lambs to be ruled over by the civil power. But Rome always goes out of her way to salvage her bishops under this pretension that they have immunity from the civil power. Okay, and that's why we see the bishops of the Roman Catholic Church who are hiding all the pedophile priests by merely reassigning them to new jurisdictions, new dioceses, new archdioceses, or simply moving them to another nation or another continent, and at last resort, 
just put them up in the hotel called the Vatican for, pra- for, for, for protection is all built on this precedence of temporal immunity from the civil power. And it is persevered in even to this day. Now, Jesus Christ fulfilled the law of God, kept it perfectly. He didn't hold any special privilege for himself, no immunity. Had he sinned one time, he would no longer be fit to be the spotless Lamb of God, and his death would have been in vain. So Jesus kept the law. He was no hypocrite. But here we see, in the most vivid detail, the premise that exposes the papacy for the Antichrist usurpation that it is. It holds its priests immune from its own law. It is not the Church of Christ. It is the Church of Antichrist. Now, people in the world are having difficulty to decide, well, who is the Antichrist? Who is the Antichrist? Well, the Antichrist hasn't come yet. Truth is, he's been with us all the time. And Christ made it so easy for us to expose and identify the Antichrist in history that it is a wonder, a wonder of wonders, that there are so many Christians who just simply can't seem to figure it out. Christ made it so easy to identify Antichrist that it is, well, maybe I'm being too hard on people, but I think it's inexcusable not to know who Antichrist is, except for the fact that the churches have held this history secret. And it's my pleasure to reveal this secret on First Amendment Radio. It says, The epistles attributed to Popes Avaristus and Alexander I, who were the immediate successors of Clement, contain nothing of special importance, but are made up of extracts from authors who lived long after, long not long before, but long after their time, and refer to matters which did not occur for more than a century after they were dead. Pope Sixtus I is made to call himself an archbishop, a word not then used, and to speak of, quote, appeals to Rome, unquote, and, quote, the grandeur of that church, unquote, and of the requirement that, quote, all bishops wait for the Pope's decision and are instructed by his letters, unquote, which the historian Dupin, or Dupin, as you might pronounce it, are, quote, modes of speaking never used by the first bishops of Rome, unquote. I mean, a child would be embarrassed to read the foundation stones in the papacy. It's kind of like my dog ate the homework. (laughs) Only a child, an invalid, could be deceived by these open fabrications. We'll continue with the pseudo-Isidorian decretals in R.W. Thompson's book, The Papacy and the Civil Power. We'll be right back. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com Worldwide. Freedom is never free. We need your support today at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis. 
as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone. Absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Welcome back from the break. We're going to continue as R.W. Thompson continues to rip to shreds how artfully he does it, too. Rips to shreds the foundation of the papacy. He, sp- he says, uh, speaking of these pseudo Isidorian decretals, this made up history, it's just simply fabricated the history of the Roman Catholic Church. Fabricated by the popes. It says, Pope Telesphorus is made to say, quote, that the laity and the clergy could not accuse one another in judgment, unquote. And two letters are ascribed to Pope Hyginus of no special import, uh, no special import, but condemned by their containing quotations from Popes Leo I, Martin I, and Adrian I, who lived long after. Now that's quite a trick, isn't it? <laughs> Using quotes from people that weren't even born at the time. It says there are also three letters from Pope Pius I, which are shown in the same way to be spurious. Pope Anicetus speaks of archbishops, primates, and patriarchs, not instituted till long after. Besides, says Dupin, quote, many other things of the same nature, unquote. Childish fabrications. There are also two letters from Pope Soter, which are also manifestly spurious. An epistle by Pope Eleutherius, uh, which treats of ecclesiastical judgments in favor of the court of Rome, establishing the, the ultimate authority in the world as being the court of Rome. He is made to insist that, quote, all causes related to the church ought to be determined there in Rome, which says Dupin, quote, is a practice contrary to all antiquity, unquote. This epistle is shown to be a forgery by abundant proofs. It copies a text out of St. John and attributes, and attributes it to St. Paul. It also contains, you know, that's what happens when you don't know the Bible. It also contains passages from the writings of Pope Leo I, who lived in 440 A.D., Felix III, 526 A.D., Adrian I, 772 A.D., from councils which had not yet met, and from the Theodosian Code, when Theodosius was not emperor until nearly 200 years after the death of this pope. <laughs> Masterful job of fabricating this foundation, didn't they? 
Now, in the epistle by Pope Victor I, he is made to confer upon himself the further title of Archbishop of the Universal Church and to speak of, quote-unquote, appeals to Rome. Its falsity is shown by the fact that it is addressed to Theophilus of Alexandria, who did not live till nearly 200 years after. There's also another letter of his directed to Desiderius, Bishop of Vienna, when there was no bishop of that name in Vienna till near the close of the 6th century, unquote. Pope Zephyrinus is represented as addressing an encyclical epistle, ex cathedra, that is, from the papal throne, to the bishops of Sicily, wherein he claims, quote, final, unquote, jurisdiction in all cases relating to the trial of bishops as belonging to the seat of the apostles, that is, Rome. He prescribes the rules which shall govern such trials, the chief of which is that, quote, an, uh, an accused bishop, unquote, should not be condemned by, quote, patriarchs and primates until they find that the person either confesses himself guilty or is proved to be so by witnesses trustworthy and regularly examined who shall not be fewer in number than were those disciples whom the Lord directed to be chosen for the help of the apostles, that is, 72, unquote. A number quite sufficient to prevent any conviction in any case. He then proceeds to declare, quote, Nor should anyone of superior rank be indicted or condemned on the accusation of inferiors, unquote, and that all cases should be appealed to Rome. He claims for the Pope the divine authority to bind and loose on earth and in heaven as conferred by Peter, the Apostle, and by the apostolic canons and constitutions. He then provides what was most needed for establishing the power of the Roman Catholic hierarchy and securing perfect impunity to them by covering up and concealing whatever crime a bishop may commit. In these words, here's what he said, quote, For bishops are to be born, B-O-R-N-E, in other words, carried or supported by the laity and clergy, and masters by servants, in order that under the exercise of endurance, these temporal may be maintained and things eternal hoped for, unquote. In other words, if you want this tottering Roman Catholic Church to stand, it is up to you to carry and support these bishops. No one may lay a charge against one of the Pope's bishops. They are sacrosanct, and it is your Christian duty, no matter how criminal their crimes, no matter how absurd their pretensions, you have to defend them. Otherwise, the church topples. You see, this, this Roman Catholic Church is upheld from the top, not the bottom. So we establish this Roman Catholic hierarchy and make it altogether infallible and a, and a crime punishable by excommunication if you fail to hold up these bishops, the chief of which is the Pope of Rome. You see what they've done? It says, Another epistle of, the, of this same pope to the bishops of Egypt is only worthy of notice because the claim of power it sets up for the quote-unquote apostolic church at Rome and the assertion that Peter was, quote, chief of apostles, unquote. Both these epistles are shown to be forgeries by the fact that they contain passages from Popes Leo I, 440, Vigilius of 540 A.D., Gregory I of 590 A.D., and Martin I of 649 A.D., and Adrian I of 772 A.D., and from the Theodosian Code. Pope Callistus is represented as also issuing encyclical letters upon sundry subjects. In one he says, quote, 
let no one take up an accusation against a doctor that is a teacher or a priest of the Roman Catholic Church because it is not right for sons to find fault with the fathers nor for slaves to wound their masters. You see the Nicolaitan attitude of the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church? They are the masters. Their people are the slaves. They are the fathers, and the children are the sons. And they should never contradict their superiors. In another, to the Bishop of Gaul, he says, quote, those who conspire against bishops or who take part with such are guilty of a crime and are condemned, quote, not only by the laws of the church, but of the world, unquote. That's right. The whole world is supposed to defend these bishops. And it says, defining the punishment prescribed for these offenses, he is made to say that it had been ordained by his predecessors that if the inferior clergy were guilty of it, they should be deprived of the honor which they enjoy, that those who did not belong to the clergy, quote, should be cut off from communion and expelled from the church, unquote, and, quote, that all men of both orders should be infamous, and that, too, not only for those who did the deed, but for those also who took part in such. Unquote. Assigning the reason for this extraordinary protection to the bishops and severity to their accusers, he says, quote, For it is but equitable that those who despise the divine mandates and prove themselves disobedient to the mandates of the fathers should be chastised with severer penalties in order that others may fear to do such things, and that all may rejoice in brotherly concord, and all take to themselves the example of severity and goodness." Unquote. Section 2 is on, quote, "...those who have intercourse with excommunicated persons or with unbelievers." Unquote. No one is to have any intercourse with such in speech, or in eating, or drinking, or in the salutations with a kiss, nor let him greet such, because whosoever willingly holds intercourse with the excommunicated in these or other prohibited matter, matters will subject themselves, according to the ordinance of the apostles, to like excommunication. From these, therefore, let the clergy and the laity keep themselves, if they would not have the same penalty to endure. Also, do not join with unbelievers, neither have any fellowship with them. They who do such things indeed are judged not as believers, but as unbelievers. Section 3 treats of those who ought not to be permitted to prefer an occasion, or excuse me, to prefer an accusation or to bear witness, etc. It says, quote, Those again who are suspected in the matter of the right faith should by no means be permitted to prefer charges against priests and against those whose faith there is no doubt. And such persons should be held in doubtful authority in matters of human testimony. Their voice, consequently, should be reckoned invalid whose faith is doubted. And no credit should be given to those who are ignorant of the right faith. That is, Roman Catholicism, of course. Now, even as it regards one who is entitled to make an accusation against a bishop or a priest, he must not do it except in the presence of him whom he seeks to accuse. These epistles contain passages taken from the Council of Nice and the Fifth Council of Rome, which were held long after, and from Popes Galatius of 492 A.D., Symmachus of 498 A.D., Gregory the first of 590 A.D., and Adrian the first again of 772 A.D., all showing their false and fraudulent character. 
Already, R.W. Thompson has literally exploded the foundation that establishes the temporal power of the Pope in the world. But there's more. There is an epistle containing an ex cathedra decree of Pope Urban I addressed to all Christians, wherein it is prescribed that instead of the practice which prevailed among the early Christians of holding property in common, it should be, quote, left in the hands of the bishops who hold the place of the apostles, unquote, that the bishops should have, quote, elevated seats set up and prepared like a throne to show by these that the power of inspection and of judging and the authority to loose and to bind are given to them by the Lord, unquote. Yeah, they like to sit in the high seats. Kind of sounds like those that Christ condemned when he walked among men. Those who sat in the high seats in the synagogues and loved to have all the attention of the people, make long prayers. You see the hierarchy? That's what toppled the church as it existed at the time of Jesus Christ, was this pretension of authority being the successors of Moses, they claimed at the time. And Christ mocked them and condemned them. Well, the same synonymous hierarchy is established in the Roman Catholic Church, and it is likewise condemned by the Lord. It says that the bishops should have elevated seats set up and prepared like a throne to show by these that the power of inspection and of judging and the authority to loose and to bind are given to them by the Lord, that the faithful should hold no communication with those with whom the bishops have none, and that those whom they have cast out should not be received. The forgery of this epistle is shown by the fact that it contains thoughts and words from Eusebius, who was not born until nearly 100 years after, from Pope Gregory IV of A.D. 827 and from the Theodosian Code. Complete fabrications by anyone's standards. Now, this is why Roman Catholic doctors sheepishly admit it's, it's an embarrassment to the Roman Catholic Church, these so-called pseudo-Isidorian decrees that form the foundation for the papacy. Even the bishops admit that it's a joke. It's so poorly assembled that it couldn't deceive anyone. But yet it deceives the whole world, particularly the people in governments around the world who believe that the Pope is, by divine right, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and they answer to him, not the people. That's why the the presidents of the United States, soon after they're elected, board the old nag out at the, you know, Andrews Air Force Base, kick her in the flag. She already, she already knows her way to Rome. And they go wearing black, and their wives wear black, and veils over their face in subservient submission a sign of subservient submission to the Pope. And when they get there, they have to be upon their best behavior, and they have to kiss his ring. Now, in earlier times, they had to kiss his feet. Okay, Civilized society won't permit such debasing actions without raising all kinds of hackles, except, except from, you know, especially from those who once called themselves Protestants. But they still kiss his ring, and they do what he says. And it's time for the American people to know it. Now, Pope Pont, uh, Pontianus had but little time for issuing decrees, for his entire pontificate lasted only a few months. That's right. Here's another case of a mistake by the Holy Spirit. I mean, why would the Holy Spirit pick a pope that was only going to live a few months? I mean, it means if the Holy Spirit is is the one who elects the the popes through the College of Cardinals in the Sistine Chapel, certainly the Holy Spirit could use better judgment than to elect one that had his foot already in the bucket. Okay? Complete fabrication. 
And it says, For the suspicion of wishing to disturb the peace of the Roman Empire during the reign of Alexander Severus, he was banished to Siberia, where he remained until the year three, uh, excuse me, 235 or 237 A.D., when he was brought back, quote, and expired under the scourge, unquote. <laughs> Eusebius makes his pontificate embrace five or six years, but there's great uncertainty about it. Nevertheless, epistles from him are placed among these palpable forgeries. In the first, to Felix Subscribonius, <laughs> what names, right? Felix Subscribonius, quote, on the honor to be bestowed on priests, unquote, he is represented as saying, quote, and again, they are not to be accused by the infamous or the wicked or the hostile or by members of another sect or religion. If they sin, the bishops, they are to be arraigned by other priests. You see how this works? The fox watch in the hen house? Okay. You talk about a conflict of interest. All their affairs are held internally. The priests protect the bishops. The bishops protect the pope. You can't level a charge against a Roman Catholic priest without setting off this hierarchical defense mechanism. All right? Again, they are not to be accused by the infamous or the wicked. And, of course, you're infamous and a wicked the minute you open your mouth that a priest has slept with one of the altar boys, right? They immediately label you as infamous and wicked, so your testimony isn't worth the breath it takes to say it. They're not to be accused by the infamous or the wicked or the hostile. I might be regarded as a hostile. <laughs> or by members of another sect or religion. And it says, if they sin, if these bishops sin, if these infallible successors of St. Peter sin, they are to be arraigned by other priests... Further, they are to be held in check by the chief pontiffs, that is, the popes, are their authority. They answer only to him, and they are not to be arraigned or restrained by seculars or by men of evil life. Unquote. There's your immunity status for the priests. Okay? You want to bring a charge against a Roman, a Roman Catholic priest? You bring a charge against God Almighty. And the gates of hell are unleashed against you. It says in his second epistle, quote, to all bishops, unquote, he is made to say, quote, wherefore persons suspected or hostile or litigious, you know, wanting to get into the Pope's bank account, and those who are not of good conversation or whose life is reprehensible, and those who do not teach the right faith, that is, Roman Catholicism, have been debarred from being either accusers or witnesses by our predecessors with apostolic authority. And we, too, remove them from that function and exclude them from it in times to come, etc., to show the forgery of these epistles, Dupin says they are, quote, made up of passages taken out of the vulgar Latin, St. Gregory, St. Jerome, Sixtus, the Pythagorean. The rest is written in a barbarous style. In other words, they fall on their face as laughable. An epistle from Pope Antares quote, on the transference of bishops, unquote, was designed to prove what no antecedent history shows, that Peter, as bishop, was transferred from Antioch to Rome. He says, quote, Peter, our holy master and the prince of the apostles, was translated for the sake of the common good from Antioch to Rome in order that he might be in a position there of doing more service, unquote. At another place, he recognizes the obligation of the old Mosaic law, quote, that whoever has not given obedience to the priests 
should be stoned out should be stoned outside the camp by the people, or with his neck beneath the sword, should expiate his presumption with his blood, unquote, with the single qualification that, quote, now, however, the disobedient is cut off by spiritual chastisement and being cast out of the church is torn by the rabid mouth of demons, unquote. Pretty high penalty, right? And it says, Dupin establishes this forgery by showing that the author speaks of a bishop of Ephesus named Felix when there was none such, and of a bishop of Alexandria named Eusebius, which was untrue. He also shows that he was contradicted by three councils of Antioch, Sardica, and Chalcedon, and that he quotes from popes and others who did not live until after that time. You know, these fabricators failed to do their homework. Okay? You know what this represents? This represents the most desperate attempt, the most hurried and desperate attempt to establish the papacy. And you know what else it does? It proves just how subservient the people were to this Roman Catholic hierarchy that they didn't even dare question such absurd fabrications. And they had to accept them as fact. And because they've lasted over, the, over time and centuries as the basis for the papacy, they're still not questioned, especially by the kings of the earth and the presidents of the United States included. They would rather believe the lie. I'll see you tomorrow on Inquisition Updates. We continue to tear down the papacy. Thanks for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast and the truth about God's chosen people and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org.